over to Galatians chapter 4. Uh, we're starting in the fourth chapter tonight, and we're going to begin in verse 1. We're going to go through verse 11 this evening. And I promise uh, tonight I will not skip over the first three verses like I did on Sunday night. I know that threw a lot of people off when I was reading the scripture. Uh, my eye looked down and then looked up and looked down again, and I, I picked up at the wrong place. So we're going to be in the first verse of chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 1 and go through verse 11. And we're going to be talking about a topic uh, tonight, a very important theological truth, and that truth is... Um, is the truth of our adoption. We are adopted into a heavenly family when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. We become children of God. We become brothers and sisters in Christ together. And so we are going to look at that rich theological truth called adoption here in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. I've entitled our message, Adopted by the Father. I'll go ahead and read our text in its entirety, all 11 verses, and then we will come back through and break this text down verse by verse. Here's what Paul says. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I have labored over you in vain. Let's pray again together. Father, this is your word. And Father, it is indeed without error. It is authoritative. And Lord, we submit to it. Father, as your church, we thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, your word will not return void, but it will go and do what you have set it out to do. I pray, Father, tonight that, Lord, as we get into your word, we would take it, we would receive it. It would not go in one ear and out the other, but we would allow it to change our lives from the inside out. Lord, we love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so if you go to Scotland or to anywhere that has a lot of sheep, sooner or later, you're going to see a little lamb who is running around the field with what looks to be an extra fleece tied onto its back. There are little holes in the fleece for its four legs and a little hole for its head. And if you see a little lamb running around like that, it usually means that its mother has died. And without the protection and nourishment of a mother, the orphaned lamb will also die. If you try to introduce the orphan lamb to another mother, the new mother will butt it away. She won't recognize the lamb's scent and will know the new baby is not one of her own. But thankfully, most flocks are large enough to have a mother that recently lost a lamb. And so the shepherd skins the dead lamb and makes its fleece into a covering for this orphaned lamb. And then he'll take the orphan lamb to the mother whose baby just died. And now when she sniffs the orphaned lamb, she smells her own lamb. And instead of butting it away, what she does is she accepts and adopts that lamb as her own. I wanted to start off our, our time together tonight because of our topic, which is adoption. 
You see, adoption is a spiritual reality for every single one of us in this room that has placed our faith in Jesus Christ. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we are no longer condemned sinners. What we are, we are sons and daughters of God. We are children of the Father. Okay, But also what we become, we become brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know what that means? We will spend eternity one day with each other. Amen? Oh, me? <laughs> this evening, we're going to look at this text. And we're going to see that Christians are indeed adopted into the Father's family when they trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And what we're going to see here in this text are three truths regarding this spiritual adoption. And the first truth comes from the first five verses. And it's this. When we are adopted into the Father's family, He gives us a new identity. He gives us a new identity. Look what Paul says again, verses 1 through 5. He says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. And in the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. All right, so in the first verse, Paul says something very interesting. He says that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. The word heir is a person who is to receive something as a possession, much like a beneficiary, okay? And this Heir, as long as he is a child, he says, is no different from a slave. Now, in the original language of the New Testament, which is what we call Koine Greek, there are different words used for child, depending on the age. And the word that is used here is a word that refers to a very young child. It can even be a reference to an infant. You see, in Roman times, when, when Galatians was written... If a child's father was to die, the child would inherit the estate only after they became of age. And so all of the father's money, all of the father's uh, belongings, his home, and all of those things are put under what is called here in verse 2, guardians and managers. Some translations will call those managers stewards. Okay, A guardian was a person appointed to look after the child after the father had passed away. He would make sure the child was safe and did what he needed to do. But the manager, the second person here in verse 2, was the person who was in charge of the estate. He would look after the stuff. He would, he would look after the money. He would manage the estate. And so what Paul is doing here, like he did on Sunday night when we were looking in the third chapter, he's using an illustration. He's doing what a good preacher does. He's illustrating a point. And so to illustrate the spiritual immaturity, Paul calls these Galatian Christians who desire to listen to these bad Sunday school teachers, these Judaizers, as children, spiritually speaking. Children who desire to live under guardians and managers. He actually says in verse Three, that they desire to be in slave or in bondage, which means to make someone submissive to another person's interest. So by birthright, the child would own the whole estate. Nevertheless, he was kept submissive, much like a slave, in that he enjoyed no freedom and he could make no decisions. And so what Paul does is he applies this illustration here to contrast our former life as sinners condemned to now Christians who have trusted in Jesus, who are free from sin and bondage. Okay, He says here, before they were saved, they were slaves. But in Christ, they and we have a new identity. Because in verse 5, he says, we are adopted. We were sinners 
condemned, we are now adopted sons and daughters of God. Paul in verse 3 makes a reference here to these elementary principles. Some translations will say elements of the world. And this is one word in the original language. And the definition is a transcendent power that is in control over world events. And so depending on who you read, what commentator you read on verse 3, what scholar you read on verse 3, they will come to different conclusions on what these elementary principles are. However, knowing that the Galatians were mostly Gentile, okay, this is likely a reference to the pagan religions that they once practiced and now the temptations that are coming their way through these Judaizers, these bad Sunday school teachers. And so Paul says something magnificent in verse 4. He says, when the fullness of time had come. Don't miss that. When the fullness of time had come, he says, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. To do what, Paul? Why did, why did God do that? He tells us in verse 5. To redeem those who were under the law. To redeem. We talked a lot about redemption on Sunday. I want to see who remembers what redemption is. What does it mean to redeem? Does anyone remember? Purchase. To purchase, exactly. We were purchased. We were purchased by God. Do you, know, do you remember what the currency was that purchased us? The blood of Jesus. We were purchased out of bondage, out of slavery to sin. We were purchased through Jesus' blood. That's what redemption is. That's what it means to redeem. We have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. He secured us. He has liberated us. He has purchased us. But he's also, as verse 5 says here, he has adopted us. That word adopted is a transferred sense of relationship between God and between humans. And so Jesus came for two purposes here. He came to redeem us, to save us, to purchase us, to, to free us from slavery of sin and the law, but he also came to adopt us, to make us children of God. And these rights, adoption and redemption, they come as a gift, or they don't come at all. And what Jesus does is he gives us a new identity. He takes us from being condemned sinners to being children of God who have been redeemed. Father Greg Boyle is the founder of an, of an organization, and I think this is kind of funny. The organization is called Homeboy Industries, and it's located in East Los Angeles. And he has put together a team of physicians trained to remove the tattoos of ex-gang members. The service is crucial for their success in making it outside of the gang. Gang-related tattoos prevent many former gang members from getting jobs or advancing in work. And for others, the markings put them in serious danger on the streets. There is no fee or community service required to receive the services that are offered by this company. Tattoo removal is strictly a gift. I want you to listen to what the founder and director here says about removing gang tattoos. He says this, quote, Currently, more than a thousand names are waiting on a waiting list. The seeming permanence of a gang tattoo fosters the attitude that the gang's claim is also permanent. And don't miss this. He says that gang tattoo is a mark of ownership and identity. The emotional consequence is that the tie seems to a part of a person that can never be shaken. I suspect some of us have felt like this with past sins, whose mark we cannot shake off, though we have been cleansed by the blood of Christ. And perhaps the imagery of tattoo removal 
can invoke a renewed sense, he says, of our blessed assurance. And like former gang members who have had the marks of a former life removed, he says this, so our sins are blotted out by the blood of Christ and our sins are remembered no more. These gang members were identified as being in a gang because of these tattoos. Their identity was tied up with being in that gang through those markings. And this company, physically speaking, sought to remove those tattoos in order to give these men and these women a new identity. But not only were they concerned about the physical well-being of these folks, they were concerned about the spiritual well-being of these folks through sharing the gospel that a new identity can be acquired through faith. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we are no longer condemned sinners. We are children of God, and we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Adoption into the Father's family means we receive a new identity. But number two, adoption into the Father's family gives us, and we've talked a lot about this, gives us the Holy Spirit. Look what he says again here in verses 6 and 7. Paul says, and because you are sons, God has sent the, son, the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So here's, here's the truth. God, God the Father not only sent his son into this world, but he also sent the Holy Spirit through his son. And so what we see throughout the New Testament is the full trinity working in the process of salvation. The spirit is a gift to every single one of us in this room that calls on the name of Jesus as Lord. He is a gift because we have been adopted. No son or daughter of the Lord lacks the Holy Spirit. Further, the Holy Spirit is present within each one of us. He lives right here. We talked about that uh, about two weeks ago. It's called regeneration. He comes into your heart and he lives. He's present. And he is the greatest evidence, don't miss this, of your adoption. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 1.14. He says, the Holy Spirit, listen, is the guarantee, guarantee, of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. He's the guarantee. In other words, you can't lose him. Amen? He can't be taken away. Holy Spirit resides in your heart. That is one of the benefits, one of the blessings of being adopted. In verse 6, at the very end of that verse, Paul uses two names for God here. He uses the names Abba and Father. And so let's look at both of those names just briefly for a second. The word Abba is a term of endearment. Okay, we could actually translate this word Abba as Daddy. Okay, and some, and some translations will actually do that. Abba is a term of endearment. And this word indicates intimacy and trust. And this was completely opposed by the Judaizers, the bad Sunday school teachers who were pushing legalism. If you remember back in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verse 36, this is one of the names that Jesus used of the Father. Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. The word Father here comes from the Greek word patros. And it has many meanings, okay, depending on the context. It can mean anything from parents to ancestors, but in the context of Galatians chapter 4, it is a reference to the supreme deity who is responsible for the origin and care of everything that exists. And so Paul concludes this section out that the Galatians were no longer slaves, but they were children of God, and they were under gra grace. They have progressed from being slaves to being sons and heirs who possess the Holy Spirit. 
In preparation for this message earlier, uh, I read a story about a Presbyterian minister. And I'd like to read this short story to you. Here's what he says. He says, when I was a child, my father brought home a 12-year-old boy named Roger, whose parents had died from a drug overdose. There was no one to care for Roger, and so my folks decided that they would raise him on their own. And at first, it was difficult for Roger. He had a hard time to adjusting to the new home. And several times a day, this Presbyterian minister recalls his parents saying to Roger, No, no, we don't behave like that in this family. No, no, you don't have to scream and fight and hurt people to get what you want. No, no, Roger, we expect you to show respect in this family. And over time, Roger began to change. Now, did he have to make those changes to become a member of our family? No, he was a part of our family by the grace of my father. But he did have to work hard because he was in the family. He goes on to say this, it was tough for Roger to change and he had to work at it, but he was motivated by gratitude for the amazing love he had received. And then he asked us this question, do you have a lot of hard work to do now that the spirit has adopted you into God's family? Certainly, but not to become a son or daughter of our heavenly father. You make these changes because you are a son or daughter. And every time we revert back to our old sinful ways, it is the Holy Spirit who says to us, no, no, that's not how we act in this family. You see, as believers in Christ, we enter into God's family. We've been set free from our sinful ways and we are released from this bondage and we are free to live for Jesus. We have been adopted. We have received the Spirit. We have uh, a new identity. Griffin, may we live accordingly in his family. Adoption into the Father's family gives us the Holy Spirit. Adoption into the Father's family gives us a new identity. But finally, adoption into the Father's family, this is very important, gives us a new allegiance. It gives us a new allegiance. Look at verses 8 through 10 and 8 through 11, excuse me, in closing. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how have you how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless? elementary principles of the world, whose slaves you want to be once more. You observe days and months and seasons and years, and I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. So before the Galatians came to faith in Jesus Christ, they worshiped pagan religions. They worshiped Greek gods. You've probably heard of these Greek gods before. Greek gods like Zeus or Hermes, okay? And when they believed in Jesus, they were delivered from this bondage. And Paul says something very interesting in verse 9 that I don't want us to miss. He says, but now that you have come to know God. That phrase, come to know, is one word in the Greek. And it means to grasp the significance or meaning of something. But in reference to God, in this context, the Galatians only came to know God because God revealed himself to them. In fact, that's what the verse says. You've come to know God, look what he says next, or rather to be known by God. This squares in line with what Jesus says in John 6, 44. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Paul says that they have come to know God, or rather to be known by God. In other words, the Galatians could never say, 
I did it all on my own. I came to know God because I'm just smart. I'm intelligent, you know. I, I came to know God because I figured it out. It's, it's much like my son when, when he uh, uh, made his first peanut butter and jelly sandwich. He came to me, he said, look, I made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and I did it all by myself. The Galatians couldn't do that. The Galatians couldn't boast and say, I know God, I have a relationship with Jesus and I did it all by myself. They couldn't do that. And even though God has saved them and they have come to know him, verse 9 says that they were turning back again. In other words, they were changing their mind or course of action for worse. Why in the world, Paul would ask, would you give allegiance to the legalism of these bad Sunday school teachers when God has done everything to save you. He's done it all. Why would you give your allegiance to anything or anyone else? Paul was upset. Paul thought that he, in fact, had labored over them possibly in vain. That's what he says here in verse 11. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. That word vain can mean uh, without success, without result, to no avail. In other words, if they had continued down the road of listening to the bad Sunday school teachers and getting into this legalism, Paul feared that his efforts may have been wasted. And this can only mean one of two things. Number one, maybe some of them weren't saved. And that's quite possible. In many churches, there are people Sunday after Sunday that are sitting in the pews that don't know Jesus. But also, it could mean that they weren't growing in their faith. Their allegiance was not to Jesus Christ. And that is one thing as followers of Christ that we must make sure we have every single day is that we have allegiance to the Lord Jesus. That every single day we are spending time in the Word of God. Every single day we are spending time in prayer. Every single time we can, we come together to worship the God and King who has saved us and released us from this bondage, who has done everything to save us. Our allegiance is owed to Him. I, when I was in youth ministry, I would often describe or illustrate spiritual growth and allegiance by using the stock market. If you have an iPhone or an Android, you've probably got a stock market app on your phone. And, uh, and, I, and sometimes I can really get into that stuff and follow the stock market, but sometimes if you look at the stock market based upon a day, week, or even a month view, what you'll see sometimes is a green line going straight up or sometimes a red line coming straight down in that one week, one month view. But if you take a step back, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, what do we see in the stock market? We see a green line that progressively goes up. Now, it doesn't go up straight. It kind of has dips in it, right? And I think that's illustrative of what our spiritual growth is like at times. We can look at our month view or our week view of our walk with Jesus. And if we're having a good week or a good month, man, we're, we're, we're just on fire for Jesus. Things are going great, you know. Um, but sometimes we might get some, some bad news. We might get a, a bad diagnosis. Uh, an accident might happen. We, we lose a loved one. Something happens and we get depressed, you know, and, and that takes its toll. And, and, and for some reason or another, we, we, we get away from the Lord and our, our spiritual growth starts to go down a little bit. But if you step back and look at your life over the span of 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, it should be progressively going up because your allegiance is to Him. Check your allegiance. May I check my allegiance? Because I'm going to be very honest with you. Every single day, I have to get up and I have to get on my face and admit to my Heavenly Father that I've messed up. I sin every single day. I'm no different than anyone in, sitting in this room. We have to make sure our allegiance is to Him. And once again, I know I said it last week, I know I'm speaking to the choir on Wednesday night. 
but we have to be sure that we are spending time, that we are growing, and that we are loving the Lord Jesus, that we are telling people about Christ, that we are inviting people to his church, that we want to see people get saved, that our passions are lining up with, with what he is passionate about. How is your allegiance tonight? That was, the, that was the point that convicted me, my allegiance. May we all be more dedicated to the Lord Jesus every single day. May we love him more today than we did yesterday. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we could gather together tonight to read your word. We thank you, Father, that we could study that we could pray, that we could sing. Father, we're thankful that, Lord, that everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus will be saved and that we are adopted into a heavenly family, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We've been given a new identity. Lord, we're no longer sinners condemned. We are children who will have eternal life in heaven with you one day. Lord, we are uh, uh, your children who have been given your spirit. You've given us everything we need for life and godliness. You have redeemed us. You have gifted us with your spirit. And Lord, we are thankful for that truth. The Father, for everyone in this room, beginning with myself, may our allegiance be 100% on you. May we not be distracted by the world and the things around us. But may we, as we are briefly here on earth, may we be about your business, telling other people about the wonderful Savior who has radically changed our lives. Will we love you? And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.